Climate change is not real. As we're recording this episode, it's uh, it's January, and today it's uh, it's nearly sixty degrees. Now, for those of you who have never heard of New York, which is probably seven people in the entire world, um, usually in the winter time, it's not that cold. It's like maybe in the forties, maybe in the thirties, but fifty-eight degrees, sixty degrees is like not very common. Um, last week we actually got some snow uh, for the first time in like two years, and it was only flurries; it didn't really stick. But upstate, you know, they'd be they be kind of going through it. So, um, yeah, that was that was our uh, polarizing thought for the day but uh to start it out uh with other polarizing topics uh currently we have a lot of war tensions looming we have the obvious one in the middle east between palestine and israel you know new uh new reports come out every day regarding that but now we have the red sea tensions which is taiwan's about to elect a new leader um china is barricading stuff oil tankers were getting blown up and things like that so as a as a I guess this is more of a global issue because there's so many global superpowers in play. Where do you think we're headed in, in regards to that? Um, <clears throat> damn, dude, you laying it on heavy off rip. Um, I mean, we don't get too political, but just, you know, an observation thing yeah. as, some, as two people who kind of like are, are tapped in. Um, where are we going with war tensions? Uh, my opinion on that stems from my knowledge of where wars stem from, I mm-hmm. guess. Yeah. And I, I mean, historically, I, correct me if I'm wrong, and someone will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think most wars that stem from either a lack of something or... Jealousy. Jealousy or... Yeah, jealousy, but an, an, an egregious need for something they don't have, mm-hmm. you know, which is all tied into the same thing. Um, where do I think we're going? I mean... I don't know what the it's it's is it over oil is it over like so in the Red Sea I know there's like I think it's like some rebel group some Iranian rebel group and they're like causing stuff over there and the United States isn't like too cool with Iran and then also over there is Taiwan and there's been like a blockade China's put up like a blockade because they don't identify Taiwan as like their own separate country and then obviously the U.S. has to get involved with that too so. It's just like a, a, a falling of multiple dominoes, basically. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think we're headed towards um, I, some sort of rec- uh, 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 reconciliation, I would hope. I mean, wars have been going on since the dawn of time, since man could harness fire and tools. Um, but I think, I don't know. I mean, wars usually end. I mean, we've had what was the big war when we were in school when Bush the Iraq was president? War. Yeah, the Iraq the Iraq war. I mean, that ended, right? Yeah, I mean, technically, yeah, yeah, yeah like it, <laughs> technically, I mean, technically, it did. Yeah. Technically, that ended. So, I mean, I think it, it'll come to a to to a, a, a agreement to cease a ceasefire on one day. Yeah, I mean, I think right now there's just too many, there's too much big weaponry in the world where. If it goes too far, everyone kind of knows like what the elephant in the room is. So it's like, all right, mm-hmm. let's stop this. You know, let's nip this in the bud now before. That's a very good point. We all have energy. nukes, so it's like, bro, you're OD and now. You know, I could just drop this nuke, yeah, right? Yeah, it's like, all right, bro, chill. Let's yeah, just stop dragging training. it crazy. It, uh, but I think that's that's a good, uh, um, I guess buffer we have now in current modern day times. The fact that rules are implemented into warfare. It's not just like. You can do whatever you want. Do whatever you want, yeah. Because if that were the case, I mean, we probably have something like uh, refugees—not refugees, but but um, overseas mercenaries running through the streets of New York City, just doing crazy stuff. You know, yeah. But it's probably a hidden reason why that but has, has happened. Has anyone too. ever really paid for war crimes? I feel like we we hear about it, like oh, this country or this person's. On, uh, I guess it post World War Two, the Nazis kind of did. Uh, and I and I mean like 
but war then they crimes for against now, so. war crimes against America are punished. Like, yeah, this, I don't, I don't. Is, yeah, isn't Snowden still in hiding or something? Yeah, he's probably still in China somewhere. Somewhere. Yeah. He just he just commented something about um Bitcoin, the Bitcoin ETF getting approved. So I mean, he's he's still out and about. Yeah. So maybe maybe that's what it is. It's like yeah, if it's against America, but you know, no disrespect to other countries, but y'all just really not. I guess you know, not, whatever, a, super, not, not a superpower. Yeah, it's just, that's just it's called space. So, pain. so I guess kind of like. Uh, segueing off of that so obviously we have a lot of technology now and shout out to the mw2d shout out activision um <laughs> emps and you know technological weapons and stuff like that like if if uh it went to that we're like boom lights went out and we're back to like year one do you, you think you could survive like off of just living off the land and like simple like living uh. or what's your contingency plan <laughs> if, <laughs> if they drop an EMP, bro, I don't know. Cause <clears throat> what is where, where would I go if the apocalypse just happened right now? I don't think it'd be an apocalypse. I just think like people would have to learn. Like I think it would probably be like m- no social media, but I feel like you know refrigerators and like basic stuff would probably still. Okay, be like, I mean no social media is fine. No social media, you know, TV channels is probably like. I don't know, channel one, whatever. Yeah, let's let's do two scenarios. Okay, okay. Ba- okay. We used to have the bare basics, like you know, electricity. You know, you can sh- still shower and stuff like that. So that would be our first. That would be the first scenario. What are you doing in that case? Okay, so let's say I, I still have electricity. I can still shower. Mm-hmm. There's just no social media, basic cable. You know, news is like all word of mouth again, and like you know, you got to really look for it. Carrier pigeons. I don't know. I don't know. That's interesting because. My whole plan A is making money off the internet. Yeah. So if the internet goes to shit, then like my whole plan A goes to shit. Um, but I mean, I'm still just. I mean, we all just go back to basics, right? We all just go go to work, like till land if we're doing that, or um, I'm still gonna go to my day job. I mean. Yeah, I mean, I work in tech, so like, I would just ask my boss. I can't even call him. You can't even call your boss. <laughs> You're yeah. Like. Whenever I get message back, just be like, you know what happened. Like, come yeah, on, bro. Like, do I still have a job at that point? Like, yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't like to think about like I don't like to think about that kind of stuff. Cause, you know, like, this this is you know too deep and dark. But not I, not even that. It's just like I'm I'm on that whole George Washington burn the bridges plan A only plan A kind of rhetoric. Yeah, make plan A work. Make plan A you. work because so if plan B or C you know, randomly happens. And it's like, well, I've been putting all my eggs into plan A. The whole idea about making plan A work for us Mm -hmm. is so that when plan A is done, we can then segue into our own other plan A.1, plan A.2. But the whole thing is making your money, getting everything from plan A, and then just... Yeah, and then uh, reallocating to something else. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm definitely in in the same boat as you because like, yeah, I work. I have a day job. Trading is all online now. Like you don't go to the stock market or whatever trading instruments. Like everything's online. Yeah, right. everything. Everything kind of is online or is at least attached to online. So I have zero idea what I would do too. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, let's let's hope for no EMPs. Let's you know? hope, bro. And that's 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 the whole um, premise of that Netflix movie. Um, uh, leave, leave the world, the world behind. behind. Yeah. yeah, that was the whole premise. And, yeah. um, I'd I'd be fine for it if we had the infrastructure, but we're I think we're little we're at the the tipping point where we're slightly too reliant on technology to p- completely just step back like that. If this was like 1980, we'd be fine. But I think right now it's like, yeah, if we don't have, if we don't have technology, like, like food can't get shipped places, like, you know, stuff like that. And Pandora's so, box has been like, like you said, Pandora's box has been open way too wide at this point for us to just go back 20, 30, 40, to go back a century right now. If after. we, if we went back 10 years, that's a century of innovation. Yeah, so, it's so that's years. what I mean. Yeah, like it's it's, it's too, too it's too much now. Um, speaking of uh, technology, so the Bitcoin ETF got approved. Um, what does that mean for people who are not in the finance space? Basically, people who old money, traditional money, can invest now in crypto and not worry about a rug pull, which is basically like you know a developer makes a coin and then they own seventy percent of the coins. The coin goes up in value. They liquidate everything and then everyone else came in later gets screwed over this is a protected asset class you know there's regulations all that other stuff um so i guess this would be my kind of little monologue thing but i would say get into crypto now i've been in crypto since 
2016 ish i had a bitcoin mining rig in college with my friends shout out uh, zach gorman shout out josh shout out alex um you know and i've seen the cycles i've seen the way things move right now bitcoin's at like 42k just like pulled back a little bit it'll probably touch around the 55k 60 mark you know um within this year and then for the four-year cycle that or two-year bull cycle that we're going to have it may see 100 200 300k bitcoin has sailed um you're you're too late on bitcoin you should have been in it in 2008 when the financial uh housing uh crisis happened i was 11 you know it is what it is um but for all of you who are older than me shame on you um but now uh there's alternate coins that are kind of in a bitcoin like position bitcoin you know is worth at its peak was like 70k I don't know what kind of percentage raise that is from, you know, probably 0.0001 cents to $70,000. But there are other crypto coins out there that have utility, that have other use cases. You know, Dogecoin was, you know, a popular one that um, people were into, you know, even the the normal people who know nothing about crypto. They were into, you know, Bitcoin. I think Dogecoin went from like 0.001 to 73 cents. You put in a hundred bucks, it's probably like 10 K, 20 K, 30 K, something like that. So there are other coins like that. However, crypto has a very difficult, um, it's hard to use as a new user. There's so much information you have to grasp. Things are changing crypto. I'll put it this way in traditional finance, you hear a news headline, you know, you have two weeks of the market wrestling with it in crypto. Uh, those are more like the people who look like they do stimulants 24 seven because uh, six hours in crypto is like a week in traditional finance. So you always have to be online, always be tapped in things like that for the older people. Um, I get it. You may not want to be on your computer 24 seven. You got kids, you got this going on, find some kid in your local neighborhood. Who's already a dope fiend and is on the computer anyway, write up a little contract. Hey, I'm gonna give you money. You're going to invest in whatever you can take a percentage of the profits, blah, blah, blah. But Crypto is going to be the new stock market, basically, for, for this generation. So find someone who knows about crypto, who's already in crypto, and get into vest- investing. All you have to do is do some research on what coins make the most sense. There are meme coins, which are fun little things like Dogecoin, Shiba Inu. Um, you know, they don't have any utility, but people back, rally around them, people invest in them, and then they go up to, you know, you know, 73 cents a dollar, but they start at, you know, nine decimal places over. You put in a little bit of money. At most, you lose a hundred bucks. You know, you stand to gain a, a crap ton. There's other ones with utility. AI is a big thing right now. So, you know, there's plenty, uh, there's plenty to, um, to, you know, invest in. So that was just my little, my little diatribe. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, yeah, I know about ETFs. I was, um, on the SMP wave, uh, about a year and a half ago, two years ago, had a couple thousand S and P. Then mm. had to take it all out for some life stuff. But yeah, same thing. Um, investing in stocks actually like helped me with bills like a couple times. So yeah. it's it's definitely worth it. Definitely, definitely. I- I'm looking to pivot back into it. I want to find the right way I can pivot uh, my finances into a stock while still having enough to spend for my life while still saving. And while not having it sit there with the idea of letting it grow until I'm like 50, 40, or 60 years old to yeah, be a millionaire I, then, you know? I think that's a myth, too, that people underestimate is like people who invest in stocks already have a crap ton of money. Yeah. You're not going to get rich off of investing 250 a week into stocks. You need to be putting in at least five figures because uh, the S&P on average returns 7% a year. Yeah, 17%. So if, so if you're putting in $10,000, that's only $700 per year. You're not going to, you can't live off of that. But, but there is an important philosophy called the freedom figure. And um, on that same topic of people who have money already invest or people who already have money invest and reap the biggest rewards. If someone could understand how much they need to live for a year's time and then calculate how much the S&P would return based off that 7 8%. <clears throat> Someone can deduce how much money they would need in the S&P 500 to never have to work a day again in their life. Yeah, exactly. So my freedom figure for example, I'll just tell you, so I don't I don't have I'm not near Yeah, who's going to press you like <laughs> Yeah. But my freedom figure is 2.5 mil, right? So if I have 2.5 mil in the S&P, 
I can draw down $80,000 a year off the 7 8% and never have to work again for my life. And I can live comfortably in outside of America, $80,000 a year USD. Like 90% of the world. <laughs> you're, you're, fi- you're like, you're probably, yeah, 80K is probably like equivalently like quarter of a million. I'm chilling, bro. So yeah. the, understand that. And I would say, don't just take it from us. Do your research and understand more about the personal finance about, uh, uh, game and and the freedom figure philosophy, but and the fire movement, all that stuff. Uh, yeah. Financially independent, retire early. Jalen actually, um, what's the name? Quickest Tempo, who we had on uh, last year. He's in Colombia right now. He's thriving. He's you know he's living life, dancing, doing weightlifting stuff. Like not worried about money. Right. You know. So yeah. So uh, it's, it's all it's all about understanding goals. It's 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 based on um Aristotle's first principle in in manifestation and proper goal setting if you know where you are you know where you're going everything else in between will just follow suit as long as you're putting in the work now for you like for you to move do you do you ever have like a, a like a wrestling thought of like oh like you know my family's in the states this and they no. <laughs> <laughs> not at all bro it's like if people want to see me they can book a flight or i can help them book a flight if I want to see somebody, I'll just take a trip to go somewhere. Yeah. But I mean, that's the downs the that's the upside of the downside of not having a close knit family in America. Yeah. Like, I'm not tied yeah, you're not to anything. Tied to anything. Yeah. 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 I feel I feel like that sometimes because on one of the sides of my family, everyone's kinda like spread out. So I'm like, I only see you guys once or twice a year anyway. So, right, right, right. Um, you know, then we'll just have Thanksgivings at my place because, you know, it'll be, you know, a fraction of the cost. Right. So yeah yeah that is true um there's something in here i wanted to talk about but i think you should bring up your point before that one um so oh yeah about the the fasting thing so um i usually do like regular fasting too, like food fast and stuff but not right now um been just enjoying grubbing and just eating healthy but right now i'm kind of doing like a musical fast Mm -hmm. so that's uh that's i've been like abstaining from music like just not really listening to music i've been just on my youtube grind sigma grind set Mm -hmm. um and then when i do listen to music i like kind of like delve into other genres like i've been listening to jazz now um not that i didn't before but just more so also classical music a little bit more so so as a musician do you ever fast from music not from just producing it but also from listening like where you're just like just nate like just whatever normal life sounds that's the only music that you kind of hear yeah it's kind of ironic that you put this in today's talk talking points because i lost my airpods two days ago that's tough well you shouldn't be wearing airpods anyway yeah Yeah, get the get the wired joints bro yeah i'm getting the wired joints next yeah Yeah. but anyway um do i take musical fasts yes the answer is 100 percent yes because uh as someone who creates music and who has created music for the last 10 years um music one gets stale to me even my own music gets stale i agree that's yeah. why i'm like when i listen to it again it like hits like i've been listening to it for the first exactly. time. exactly and another issue is um because i personally think that the quality of music nowadays is drastically decreasing oh my god at I, an exponential rate because i look at of the, how accessible the, everything is i yeah. look at the weekly releases bro and i'm like I don't need. What's the point? It's either it's either someone has a bad mix, but good lyrical content, or a good beat, or good lyrics, a bad mix, a bad beat. Like there's no there's no cohesion in yeah. the creative process. So, what I find myself doing, even when I still had my AirPods and I would drive around a lot, I would just default to classical music. Uh, classical music is kind of like my detoxification process. Yeah, that's when it's still tuned to like 432 hertz yeah. and everything. You know, there's so many studies on it, how beneficial it is. So even though you're not like into it, you know, just, you know, on a unconscious, subconscious level, like you're you're just, you're in a good frequency. You're in a good, you know, state of mind. I can hear my inner voice louder. Um, I can listen to how things should sit sonically in a frequency spectrum because mm-hmm. it's all natural music, a violin, a piano. Mm-hmm. They're all going to sound like a piano or a violin, not a synth or like not Omnisphere or something. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when I'm on these fasts, I find myself, I listen to podcasts, reading a book. I haven't read a book in a while, but audio, listening to audio books. Mm-hmm. Um, you use Audible? Nah. This, they have audio, audio books on Spotify. But don't you have to pay for them? Nah. I pay for Spotify. Oh, because well, some of them I looked up and then they're like, oh, some other subscription thing. So. Nah, I don't know. My shit's... I, it, last time I used it, it said um, 
you get like a book a week or some shit. Oh, that's what. Okay, yeah. Yeah. So like all a right. book a week, and I'm I'm bouncing between Outliers and Shoe Dog. Shoe Dog. What Shoe Dog? Is Shoe about? Dog is um the creator of Nike's biography. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, no. I yeah, actually reading about biographies is cool because I always wonder about like other people like, oh, you know, what's going on? But there? it's so funny because I started Shoe Dog first and then you told me to pick up Outliers and then I listened to Outliers and then I had this thought in my head where it's like listening to biographies or reading biographies about great people kind of Outliers debunks that because mm-hmm. we could learn about all these people's lives. Mm-hmm. But the only thing we're gonna we're gonna do is find out where uh, the tipping point was in terms of how lucky they got. Yeah, because I mean, luck plays a huge part in success. Yeah, um, but not just luck is like you know roll the dice. Mm-hmm. It's like timing, timing, location. Um, yeah, like in t- like things you're literally like not in control of. It's exactly. like you can you can hard work your way through whatever. Um, but if you're five ten, you're you're not going to be a shooting guard in the NBA, you know. Yeah, and that's why it's good to start things young, you know. Like mm-hmm. I started music young. I could have started younger in terms of my professional career, because if I started professionally when I was sixteen, I would have been out of here by now. Yeah. Right. But because I only started professionally like three four years ago in terms of dropping and keeping my shit out there and working towards actually making myself an income out of this, mm-hmm. those seven six years prior aren't completely negated but they don't really add towards my monetary repertoire only towards my 10,000 hours of practice reps in repertoire which yeah. is it's good in a sense but it's not where I'd like it to be in terms of the finances you know yeah no it makes sense so I guess in that same breath I mentioned outliers um what do you think let me see let me get this question real quick hold on hold on hold on what are the pros and cons of following in the steps of outliers? I just mentioned how um, it takes luck, it takes location, it takes being in this, the right place at the right time. But there is a work aspect involved in, into it. So what do you think about you know, yeah. following in those steps? So I think, I think it's good mentally for like a it can be done sort of thing. Um, but it can be a little bit disheartening as well because you realize like, how many things kind of have to go right and how many moving pieces there are. Mm-hmm. Um, so for example, I think there's a lot of people who are in, I would say our boat in that we have all the information. We don't mind putting the work in, we don't mind whatever, but we don't have a network to put us in the, the faces of the correct people to launch whatever our personal slash joint endeavors are. Mm-hmm. And then also money. That's the biggest resource. Um, if you've read Outliers, highly recommend you reading it. I'll only use one example just to not spoil the rest of the book. But uh, we were just talking about tech. And actually, you know, the next question will be tech related too. So Steve Jobs, for example, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, uh, Larry, somebody who also co-founded Apple. Bill Joy, I think was mentioned in the book yeah, as well. All of them have something in common. They were born in like the 50s and 60s. They were all from the West Coast slash Pacific Northwest. Bill Gates' mom knew like the president of the of the University of Washington. So he was playing with computers at like 10 years old mm-hmm. for hours on end. Steve Jobs' dad was like some big person in Syria, moved over here, knew someone else who, you know, got Steve in with a bunch of things. Plus, Steve Jobs was a genius before that. Larry, whoever, the, one of the other co-founders of Apple, was also like a, a coding genius, also from the same area. As the tech boom was happening... So all of that is like, I didn't mention a single ability thing. I just mentioned location and time alone. So if you were born on the East Coast, South, Canada, you could have been one of those people, but you weren't just there at the same time. And not to say um, that none of it was also innate talent because there's a bunch of other people born in that same time and same location and didn't become those people. But all of that is just pure networks um, and connections and then being in the right place at the right time, you know, alone. So, um, you know, it, it kind of sucks because it's like, why them, not me? Um, but at the same time, I think it's, it is good that it's, it's also sobering because you realize that, hey, if I was an exception, I'd already know by now. And then two, I'm not an exception. I can accept it and do the best that I can despite that versus using it as a crutch of like, 
oh well i'm not bill gates oh i'm not steve jobs like you know uh so it's like a it's like a balancing act of like knowing what's achievable but also knowing hey i may not have like all these other advantages that they have so i kind of got to be a little bit more resourceful and i can't really rest on laurels that they you know necessarily had i i think i'm also going to implement implement my two cents here um there was one about Mozart, right? Mm-hmm. And, I, and you mentioned something about if I'm not the exception now, I'm probably not the exception, full stop. Um, I just know that putting in work, it shows the, the, the incremental steps towards getting to that outlier status. Yeah. So all the things could, all the conditions could be met, right? So for example, like for me, when I was 16, all the or when I was like what 14, 15, when I first dropped that song in Garage Band, by the time I started making my music, right, that was my first, that was me just jumping into it. Mm-hmm. By the time I started, Joey Badass already had a video out for Waves that was on TV. Um, Tyler was already uh, uh, pushing his like a Yonkers, which was on, I forget which album Yonkers was on, but he was pushing his album. He was probably like three or four projects deep at that point. Mm-hmm. Like during that that era, and that was like the beginning of the DIY era. Yeah. You know, everyone was doing stuff in Logic and, and figuring it out. No YouTube, barely any YouTube tutorials. You had to stress and struggle to figure things out. And I mentioned Mozart because Mozart was in a similar situation to Steve Jobs, to... um to 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 bill gates to where he was a prodigy young his father was also a composer Mm -hmm. they had access to musical equipment back in those days but the reason why i mentioned working hard towards becoming the exception mozart's biggest musical composition wasn't until he was 32 yeah so there there are times in, in as long as people keep their head down and keep grinding there will be a time when success all the fruits of your labor will, will, will come to fruition and there'll be time to reap you know the, the sow is the seeds you've sown yeah no i mean hard work there's no negative to hard work like there's no negative to putting in work because you may not be as talented as somebody else but you put in the hard work to close the gap or even if you're not successful and you fail you still learned a lot during that process so definitely not um string against the hard work tip um But, you know, like I said, there's just other variables that you couldn't even you can't even account for. There are unknown unknowns. Um, So, uh, you know, just put your best foot forward regardless. Um, But also, you know, talking about tech. So we're two weeks into 2024, just about. And we've already seen layoffs from Google just happen. Microsoft Discord just happened. Cloudflare just happened. Amazon Xerox. VideoAmp Twitch just happened. Disney. Duolingo, hmm. Duolingo, I don't, uh, they're not, they're not a tech company to me, but whatever. Uh, Instagram and a couple others. Last year, the, we, you know, people chalked it up to, oh, there's a recession coming or there was over hiring from like the pandemic. But in two weeks, a quarter million people just lost jobs in tech. So what do you, why do you think that is? Or like, what is, is that a sign of anything or? Maybe it's AI. Mm-hmm. Maybe AI t- is, is, is now finally taking jobs of, uh, uh, people's jobs and now we're and it's, uh, and it's the white collar people too so now it's like people, oh yeah. now now we gotta now we gotta do something about it guys now it might be an issue that that ai is taking white collar jobs uh that's my biggest i guess hypothesis mm-hmm. um hmm. yeah i mean that's all i could think of really i mean all, aside from the world was closed for a year and a half two years mm-hmm. so i think these billion dollar companies, these multi million dollar conglomerates, um, are cutting back to try and get back what they lost during yeah. the world's closure. And I think they were probably biding their time to wait to fire the right people at the right time. Yeah. And now that they found the reason to do so, they finally acted on it. Yeah. The I mean, some people were saying it's like a as with most things, it's kind of like a perfect storm or, you know, um, so some of it is maybe AI, but AI is still a little bit too new because a lot of companies don't allow you to use 
bar gpt4 at work because they can take all that information so if you work for microsoft or google like right. they don't want you putting your code their code base or whatever in there so not exactly ai yet um but maybe maybe the looming you know the the, the big companies probably have access to stuff we don't even know about yet yeah and we know uh, about the military the military has access to tech five ten years before the, the civilians get it so yeah it could um, probably be something similar for tech, tech giants yeah and then two is um some people are saying companies are, you know, just being cheap. They're, you know, they're trying to get people to work, you know, 10 jobs at once because it's doable, mm-hmm. even though it's not necessarily optimal. So they, there's less people to pay. And now, you know, people just, you know, it's like, oh, well, you can keep your job and work, you know, 10 different roles at once and be burnt out. Or you can be in the job market. And right now, obviously, with what's going on, nobody wants to be in the job market looking. Um, so there's that. And then... um it was a third point. Um, people working multiple jobs. Oh, and uh, companies are hiring different people now. So they don't want like necessarily people who are just in tech. They want other kinds of skills and things like that, which is all well and good. Um, however, I'm sure some of the people that they laid off have transferable skills to these other things. Right. Um, instead of just letting them go entirely. So I think, though, it's kind of like what Arden was talking about on our episode mm-hmm. where... You get someone who specialized in a specific role. Cool. They're with the company for five, 10 years. Cool. Whatever, whatever, whatever. But then as the world shifts, we start seeing more and more roles open up in the field of tech, in the field of whatever field someone's working in. And instead of training these people who've been there for five, 10 years, who are now salaried for a higher pay, we can find someone who's new, young, fresh, who's taught themselves these skills on the internet or through college, or through their own personal grit and resolve. And we can just start firing people and then hire these people for less because we have a name attached to us. You yeah. know? We have Duolingo, we have Instagram, we have Microsoft attached to our name. You want to work for us because you know about our name. And so, yeah, sure, we'll make room for you by hi- firing someone who's making 120 k and hire you for 80 Yeah, so I'm going to use Gary Vee as an example. Um Shout out Gary Vee, but also sorry if you if you take this the wrong way. And and in the in the rare case that you're listening to this specific episode, <laughs> but, this specific time, <laughs> <time. laughs> but um, but uh, actually just listen, just watch uh, one of your pieces about social media and content. Very enlightening. Um, so we're definitely gonna get back on the socials and really you know focus on that. But in a Gary V esque way, some dickhead would be like. Well, actually, it's good that they got fired because now they can go focus on themselves and their dreams and, you know, try and spin it like a like a toxic positivity sort of way instead of like, yeah, that's great. But like I have kids and like a family to feed and I don't have time to be looking for jobs and whatever. Yeah, that I think that uh, uh, piggybacking off our last episode, that's realism. Yeah, that's real. like like, yeah, like if I lost my job, I'd be tight. Of course, I'd be tight. Like, I have stuff to do, stuff yeah. to buy. And I could flip it like, ah, yeah, well, at least now I have more time to make some music. Yeah. And I make music for two weeks. And I'm just like, I'm hungry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, it's it's a it's a balance. Like, yes, I can look for those things. And yeah, I can maybe play golf a little bit more. But I have like things in front of me right now. Um, but the point I was trying to make was uh, for people who think being the devil's advocate makes them smart. What do you think about that? Like just being anti everything in general. I personally see it as the spirit of just being a hater under the guise of, oh, well, I'm just going to bring up this counterpoint. Um, but with logic, you can make a case for anything with the yeah. way logic works. So, yeah, what is, what's your opinion on that? Um, it depends on what it's being used for. Mm-hmm. So if I'm playing devil's advocate, like, uh, I'll bring up a recent Four channers like to use, to like to play devil's advocate. Who? Four channers. Like, Four channel, like the, like the, the, the yeah, blog post shit. Yeah, right? the, 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 the white nationalist people well you know well actually you know insert some human rights violation <laughs> why it's why it's not bad or you know whatever so no you see like nah it's because anyone anyone can provide an antithesis to a statement mm-hmm. it takes more skill to provide a concession yeah so let me explain so if i'm playing devil's advocate for somebody who just broke a plate right mm-hmm. like i dropped my plate and like i don't know how you would do that but i'm just drawing <laughs> yeah. creating an analogy right yeah so a concession let me define concession first concession is 
to refute a point by providing points in the point you're trying to disprove. Yeah. So devil's advocate is just providing the opposite point. Yeah, with no backing. With no backing. Yeah. You know, so if you want to concede, like if you want to concede or, or provide a concession, then you'd have to think, okay, well, I see why the focus right interface is the best interface for home studios because it's cheap, because it allows people with a hundred bucks to start making music, a hundred bucks in a computer to start making music. But I would suggest the Apollo Twin interface would be a little bit better because although the price point is 10 times higher, you get a higher quality sound, you get a plug-in suite that is unmatched from Universal Audio. And that's like a concession and, and, and things like that. It's like Devil's Advocate would be like, nah, well, I don't need an Apollo. I got the focus right. Focus right is focus right better because it's cheaper. Yeah. That's it. And it's like, okay, but then like, you know, there's a whole array of things you could provide mm-hmm. for for that kind of rhetoric, but that's just my two cents on that. Yeah, no, I, um, in college, I, I met a lot of devil's advocates, um, not 4chaners, but um, just people who would kind of bring up a counterpoint with the, oh, well, you have point A, which is like, you can't, you can't prove both sides. Let's say it's like a religious argument or something. And they're like, oh, well, you have the burden of proof. So that, like, that's as far as I'm going to go. I'm just going to put my two cents in of saying, no, I think you're wrong, but you have the burden of proof to do it and then run away. I'm like, that's intellectual laziness. Um, yeah. Um, and usually, yeah, in the spirit of, of like being a hater or a lack, because I mean, some of these people, I'm not going to call them out. You know, they uh pretty, pretty crappy philosophy on things. So um, don't get me wrong, though. Devil's Advocate is really good. It's good for like if you're in a think tank of like. The, the is the the great caliphate islamic empire and you're like you're making these scientific advancements and okay yeah we need you know the the science based people we need the spiritual based people we need the the non believers or the skeptics because now with all these ideas rotating now we're getting these advancements in science these advancements in math these advancements in you know life and civilization not just yeah you're wrong and then just leave like okay thanks that, nah, like you didn't you didn't add anything to anything. I would also say too, it's good to play devil's advocate to put yourself in someone else's shoes. One hundred percent. So let's say like someone got me tight, for example, right? And it's like, hmm, this person got me tight because they were they they failed to communicate something to me. Hmm. Well, maybe they one, two, three things could have happened. Then you play devil's advocate for them, and it's like, you know what? I understand where they're coming from. I'm still upset. Mm -hmm. I'm still upset, but it doesn't make me want to rip someone's head off. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's good to just look at two different viewpoints in your own mind to give yourself. It's like like that CIA clip I saw from that guy where it's like, um, when life becomes different, when you start thinking from someone else's perspective, Mm -hmm. you know, it's like looking at, your own thought processes objectively yeah. as opposed to any other. Yeah. Rationale. When you're too caught up in your own self and then you, you know, stuck in rumination or thought loops and then you're like, Oh, well, if I just look at it from this, this doesn't even make any sense. What am I worried about? Right. 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 Um, so the last, or at least my last question is, um, what is something from your childhood that you want to pick up again? Um, be it a hobby or a habit. Hobby or a habit. Something. Damn, there are a lot of things I want to do that I used to do when I was a kid. I want to watch Matt anime. I want to play video games again, card games, um, ride bikes, go penny boarding. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think I had really good habits as a kid, though. Mm-hmm. I don't know what habits I had as a kid because I wasn't exposed to too many habits. Yeah, luckily as a as a child coming from a good mother. Um, but I think my best habit was how obsessive I got over things. Mm-hmm. So if I, if I liked the game, I would just play that game until I was like the best version of myself in that game. Mm-hmm. If I was doing like, if I was penny boarding, I would penny board till my legs ached to make sure like I could do this balancing trick. I was trying to get down, like mm-hmm. make, go down this hill on one foot tight beat. You know? Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, I think just reliving my youth in a way that doesn't feel like coming out of myself. Mm-hmm. 
that's probably the biggest thing I would say I would go back and do. But what about you? Um, probably, because uh, I just thought of a question too, so yeah, I'll answer that after. Um, probably for myself would be, quote unquote, being a degenerate um, mm-hmm. in, the, in, the, in the regards of, um, you know, my mom is a big reader. Um, my, her mom, my grandmother, she was a teacher, also a big reader. Um, and so my mom, you know, as a, as a habit, she tried to get me to start reading at like one or two. Cause that's when she started reading and I'm like, I'm not you. Um, and obviously for, and I, I get this now that I'm older, like, yeah, books are very important. Mm-hmm. Um, and YouTube and stuff wasn't a big thing yet. So you couldn't just, um, engorge on information. Like you, like you could, like you had, like books were the only way you could do that in the past. So I understand that. Um, now that I'm older and also it, it feeds your left brain in a different way that you can still fantasize, but in a, in a not going off the rails sort of way. But for me, um, you know, I would, I would probably just, yeah, do the things I did that I enjoyed as a kid. So watching more TV, actually, I don't really watch like TVs and just get lost in a, in a series or a show or TV. Everything I kind of do is like in a self-help way or learning about the world or, you know, learning, learning, learning. And not that there's anything wrong with it, but you need to make it fun and enjoyable because you'll just turn into um, egghead. Like you'll just, you know, you, you Dr. Can, Punk. yeah, you'll just, <laughs> you'll just like you, you, you need it. You need a, a balance your humanity. If you're the smartest person in the room, like you're going to be bored and not be able to relate to people. You need to be able to just have fun and, you know, turn your brain off. So probably that, um, watch more movies, um, you know, think less, be more, um, probably get back into cooking again. I think that was like one of my, that's one of my like big hobbies and, you know, not to toot my own horn, but anyone who's had my food, you know, says it's busting. No, it's just slap. Um, so, but you know, with work and stuff, it's just, you know, I, I kind of eat for just sustenance because I just, I don't want to, you know, be spending two and three hours on a meal. So I'd probably say that. Um, but the question you actually made me just think of with your, um, compulsion, not compulsion, your obsessiveness is, uh, there was uh, Thierry Henry, the uh, French footballer, um, an Arsenal legend. He just had a, uh, a podcast with Diary of a CEO, um, who I always send you links for. And he was saying that, you know, he was he was the best at one point, um, but he was depressed. And, you know, all these relationship issues that he had and, and stuff like that, because his dad pushed him very hard. And obviously, Michael Jordan in the United States is that example of the, the absolute maniac um, in terms of that. And so it was a discussion on Twitter about, you know, the cost of being the best and everyone knows like, yeah, to actually be the best, you have to like kind of be psychopathic to a certain degree because the skill gap when you're at that level, like how much better can you shoot a basketball? How much better can you really cook, cook, kick a ball? Yeah. It's, it's so incremental. It's, it's, so it's all intangibles after that of like, are you willing to literally eat, breathe and sleep this thing? And then also that's why you see, um, during retirement. Cause it's like, I was obsessed with this sport and I, you know, for my health, I can't play anymore. So what do I do now? I don't know what to do with myself, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, you're looking for my two cents on that, right? Yeah, two cents on, you know, the cost of being the best. Is there is there a healthy balance or do, to be the best, do you have to be a nutcase in a certain No, nah, there is no healthy balance. Mm-hmm. I don't think there is a healthy balance when it comes to being that obsessive, that, um, that kind of uh, cream of the crop, top 1% in your field. I'll be the devil's advocate after you're done. Okay. Um... Because when it like like the, like you said, it's like when I ran track, you know. I mean, there is a very large step someone can take to becoming a better track runner. Mm-hmm. And then once you are identified as a good track runner, not a great track runner, a good track runner. Let's say for me, for example, when I w- I ran a fifty, I mean, we talked about it on the the, the Tempa episode. Um, when I ran a 51 in 10th grade, mm-hmm. which is decent, right? But in order for me to, sh- to, to get from that 52 to 51 took like months of practice, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? And like, it was just, it was that you don't feel how much of a difference one second makes yeah. until you're actually putting in the work to shave off that one second. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, um, the whole eat, live, breathe, sleep. For me, my new obsession, my current obsession is music, but not just making music. Cause I think I've kind of done my part in that. It's about the music business, right? So I'm obsessing over what X can I do to achieve Y? And, and, and 
uh, how can I maximize what I do have that I think is of decent sonic quality? Mm-hmm. How can I maximize that to reap the most reward for what I'm doing? And um, it, it just takes a different level of obsession. And I think that's why I'm a big fan of the whole Russ plan, uh, the whole Nick D plan, et cetera, et cetera. Because, yeah, I mean, they cast a big net and catch many fish. Mm-hmm. And I think that's where the whole outliers rhetoric comes from, mm-hmm. where you cannot control everything, but there are certain things you can control. And the more consistent you are and the more times you put the work in and practice, there will be more things that will come out of the the steps you've taken. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, yeah, the, de- the only devil's advocate point I was going to say is, so people were listing like the goats of their respective sports. So people for basketball will say Michael, um, people for, for the LeBron crowd, um, people always say the one thing that LeBron lacked was that killer instinct. You know, he's, he's, you know, he'd pass the ball or he wouldn't always be the person to take the last shot. Mm -hmm. So he, so that would be a case of him not being a psychopath. Um, Football, Tom Brady, you know, I think he just has a very good work ethic. I wouldn't say he's like borderline psychopathic. Um, But Messi was the one that they brought up of like, he's pretty balanced. Like he's just, he's just simply the best. And (laughs) he didn't, he didn't do anything crazy. He's not doing, you know, 6 a.m. workouts plus ice baths plus plasma infusions. I mean, he had, he did have to take HGH as a kid, but that's not like, that's not psychopathic. He was like destined to be like 5'1 or something. And he's only 5'7 now. Um, so yeah, just that there is, there is a way to find a balance, but I will, I will say even being the devil advocate to that point, Messi has an insane talent level. Like he Mm -hmm. does, he just kind of gets up and does that. He doesn't train any harder than anybody else. He doesn't do anything like crazy. He just wakes up and he's great. And that's, that's also part of the outlier rhetoric where there are probably some conditions in Messi's genome that were lined up perfectly to make him a great soccer player. Yeah, that that build actually, um, that five seven mousy, quick, agile build. Because before him, people were saying um, Diego Maradona, the other Argentine legend, the hand of God, Super Mario kind of thing. If you don't watch soccer, he was the same thing. He's like five five, five six. You know, mousy, quick on his feet. You know, dribble through defenders. So just that build for soccer alone is just makes a lot of great players. Sergio Aguero, you know, other players like right, that are right. just, you know, not too tall and can just weave through defenders. And, and that's why I'm, I'm a big fan of hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. 100%. If talent works hard, then hard work gets outworked. Yeah. You know, K- Kevin Durant is one of the greatest scorers, you know, of all time in basketball. But like I said, he doesn't work any much harder than anybody else. He's just like that. Right. But there's other people who are not like that, but can, you know, get somewhat close, you know, from just putting in the work. Um, I mean, that's everything on my end. You got anything else? Mm, no, just shout outs. What are your shout outs today? Um, shout outs to um, Martin Luther King. Thank you for the for the day off. And obviously, <laughs> and obviously all the efforts you put in in terms of the civil rights movement um, and getting, uh, you know, civil rights for, uh, you know, different ethnic groups within the nation. Uh, thankful for the weather, um, you know, 60 degrees. Cannot complain with that. Um, you know, there's some precipitation, but, you know, you can't have everything. Uh, thankful for, you know, health, friends, family, um, all that good stuff. So, um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much all I got. Uh, thankful for my co-host. Thankful for uh, my bi-weekly paychecks. Thankful for... Yeah, gainful employment for sure. Gainful employment. This. Definitely thankful for that. Thankful for my employers of who shall not be named. Uh, thank you for my mother, my father. Thank you for my mentors. Thankful for just this innate ability I've been ga- uh, uh, gifted from God. My ability to uh, be empathetic, to speak decently well, to make decent music. And uh, yeah, I'm just thankful to be alive, man. All right. Uh, that's, a, that's another episode. Um, hopefully next week. We will have a special um, gift for you, a, um, a discount code that we got with a, for an affiliate program that we both strongly believe in. So until then, uh, stay easy, make sure you're well rested, and uh, we'll catch you next week. Peace.